And so here, what do I mean by bone stress injury? Well, this was a really nice review paper and I implore you to read it. Uh, Stu Warden with Irene Davis and Mike Fredrickson did this nice review in 2014 and indicated bone stress injury represents the inability of bone to withstand repetitive loading, which results in structural fatigue and localized bone pain and tenderness. Fatigue is the word really of interest here. And so I, I often refer to these type of injuries rather than bone stress injuries, I talk about fatigue injuries because that's the mechanism by which the damage has occurred in the bone and by which we get uh, obviously these negative outcomes. So what, it, what is a mechanical pathway for fatigue injury or fatigue damage? And ultimately, we know that there's some cumulative stress that leads to damage in the bone. So a, a continued stress to the bone, and if that bone is not remodeled or doesn't have time to remodel, that continued stress then leads to some microstructural damage, so microfractures, which could then lead, uh, if the stress continues, it could lead to macroscale uh, fractures. It gets a little bit hairy here because we need to understand the, the stresses and strains of neck tissue and the total number of cycles if we really want to understand cumulative uh, stress or cumulative strain. Now this gets really challenging because as I've said there's lots of factors that go into the strength of the bone and what kind of forces are being applied to the bone. So the morphology, the material properties or density, the, uh, the reaction forces, these are kind of the gravitational loads, as well as the muscle forces go into how the, the, the bone experiences load. So this gets really challenging. And you're sitting there going, holy, you know, how do I measure all this stuff, right? I, I'm just working with my athletes day to day. Uh, I don't have an ability to, to measure this. So how is it measured? Well, this is some, some pioneering work from Dave Burr uh, in, in the 90s. And he teamed up with a, a researcher called Milgram who pioneered this method, and this is a staple that gets um, implanted into your bone. So if you're lucky enough to be enrolled in this study, you get a staple that gets banged directly into the cortex of your tibia, uh, and it, embedded in the staple are some strain gauges. So as the staple bends, it moves these little gauges, and you can measure the electrical uh, potential change as those gauges move. So this is a, a standard type of strain gauge to measure force, but the difference is that this is implanted directly into the bone. So that's really interesting because it then gives us a direct understanding of that localized strain that occurs in that, um, in that area of the bone. And so you can see these, um, these strains and you can see both compressive and tensile strains during activities like walking, jogging, running, and sprinting. And so that one part of the bone undergoes a cycle of loading that goes both compression and tension. So it changes from one to, one to the other. And you can see some of the values here of, of strain. Now these are measured in microstrain. So it's not as if the, the, the bone's bending a great deal. These are um, a more microscopic uh, strains or changes in, in deformation. So that's all well and good, uh, but holy, you know, um, I'm not going to do that either. So that really doesn't help you if you're a clinician or a, a research scientist or, or even just a coach wanting to understand what's going on with your athletes. So there's other ways of estimating bone strain, and this is what we would typically do in the research environment. We would measure the bejesus out of someone when they come into the lab. We take uh, estimates of the muscle activity, which is EMG, uh, of course, we're using inertial sensing uh, as well now, but we would do traditional motion capture where we put markers on people, we track the motion, we measure reaction forces at the ground. These are the ground reaction forces here. Then we have a, a very complicated modeling pathway that takes us through understanding the kinematics, understanding the dynamics, and then estimating muscle forces to then predict what the strains are using perhaps a finite element model. And again, you're going, well, holy, I'm, I'm not going to do that either, right? Now, none of this is within the realms of, of possibility out in the real world. This is really just for us researchers in kind of clinical environments. 
Okay, so this leads us on to some surrogate measures. What can I do in the real world? And this is where things like um, these miniaturized sensors have really made an impact and, and will continue to make a difference in the field. And the idea here is that we're getting a reasonable surrogate measure of the loads on the tibia. Obviously, we're not directly measuring the strain, but tibial mounted accelerometry has been shown to be a uh, quick and effective measurement. It's reliable, it's sensitive to things like changes in technique, changes in fatigue, and changes in different running conditions that we know change the strain in the bone. And we know that because Milgram and others have actually directly measured those strains in the bone. The challenge here is to understand what that relationship is. Uh, for running kind of dynamic impact activities, it turns out this is a reasonably good surrogate that uh, can see as you generally increase your running speed, you get increases in the, in the peak tibial accelerations, and these also correlate with increases in, in bone strain. For other activities such as say squats and deadlifts where your feet are firmly planted on the ground, you can imagine that the accelerations you measure during a deadlift don't quite uh, uh, estimate the fact that you're lifting 100 kilos, for, uh, for example. So the bone strains that you might estimate then uh, would not be representative of the, the accelerations that you measure at the tibia. Now we've done some work, this is work from Kelly Sheeran, who's at uh, Auckland University of Technology, uh, um, at the other university here in Auckland. And Kelly's done some work on a cohort of runners. Uh, and this has been done by, by many other groups as well, particularly uh, Irene Davis and, and her group, looking at the variation in tibial accelerations that you get with runners. And at baseline, we can see here, Kelly had a cohort and he took this cohort through and measured tibial acceleration, you see a, a really wide range in the peak tibial acceleration. So that's measured in Gs here. So an extraordinary range really, considering that these people are all running at the same speed. And we kind of, um, we, we've probably all, all seen this, those of us who have worked in the field of, in measuring accelerations, the, the changes in technique, changes in footwear, uh, ch changes whether you're, for example, maybe running on a treadmill or running on different uh, different terrain can can change the tibial accelerations that are experienced. And everybody here is different. Um, what Kelly's done is looked at repeatability week to week, and then he's done a study to show that if you give feedback, and he's using haptic feedback, so small vibrating motors, to say if you are experience high acceleration can you change and adapt and, and reduce your acceleration? And so that work is, is now published and Kelly's got a couple of other publications showing how you can actually change, if you get the real-time feedback, you can change your, your gait, your running behavior, your mechanics to actually reduce or mitigate some of these high impact uh, accelerations. So then we think, well, okay, that now that we can measure these tibial accelerations and let's assume that they are representative of the strains essentially that go into the bone, how do we then use this information? And we come back to the concept of a daily load stimulus. So now what we do is we have, and this is the same form that we had before, where we have the number of cycles, and that's nice, we can easily measure that with these accelerometers. We can count every step that you, that you take. And here as our surrogate of stress, we can input then the peak tibial acceleration. And you'll notice also we have our little exponent here that says the importance of the magnitude of that load that it far outweighs the importance of the number of cycles of load. So that's, that's really critical here to include that in, in this equation. So now we've got a framework where we can estimate mechanical fatigue in the real world. And this is really what we then have termed bone stimulus we initially called it a bone load. There was uh, some, some visceral um, comments <laughs> regarding that in, in the literature and, and the, um, the biomechanics colleagues of mine uh, got very upset at the idea that we called this bone load because they rightly pointed out this wasn't a direct measure of bone load. And indeed, it's, it's really more uh, an understanding, a surrogate measure of mechanical fatigue. So I'm just putting that out there for, for those of my colleagues who might be watching this presentation. Uh, 
and I accept it. We, we changed the name quickly to bone stimulus to better represent what it actually means and where it comes from. Okay, so that's uh, a bit about bone stimulus. What's uh, also uh, really interesting is the, the rest of the community is kind of understanding the importance of measuring fatigue in, in its mechanical sense as well. This is a really nice review article from Brent Edwards, who's at the HPL up in Calgary. And Brent has, really kind of outlines this idea of how we should be looking at these injuries from a mechanical fatigue perspective. And so what he's done is kind of outlined or outlined the approach that you choose. And the idea is that you be able to measure and monitor the loads in the system. These loads are of course applied to the tissue of interest. This could be bone, this also could be muscle or it could be tendon. And you understand both the, the stress strain, so this is now the deformations and the normalized forces applied to the tissue, as well as the total cycles and duration. That then goes together and has some formulation for damage. And that total damage then is, that's applied to the tissue, uh, the question is, is this damage more than some critical value? That's what this DC is. If it's more than some critical value, you get injured. If it's not, if, if it's underneath some threshold, that might then lead to some sort of remodeling or adaptation in the bone or the, or the cartilage or the soft tissue. Um, and then you have some sort of change in the structure. Then after changing that structure for that damage um, that's being applied, is that now putting us below this critical threshold, um, this process then can continue until you're in equilibrium. And this is kind of where Frost would say, you're in a mechanostat lazy zone. You've reached equilibrium, the damage is no longer um, causing micro, or micro damage to, to the tissue. And of course, if we're interested in what happens if the damage goes above this critical threshold, that's when we get injured. Brent also has some really nice papers looking at uh, predicting fracture risk, and he's using a slightly different method here with a, a probabilistic type approach. But essentially what he's saying is, in this paper it's kind of interesting, what happens if you increase your running speed and you go from two and a half to four and a half meters per second? And you might see uh, this is contact force that he's modeled, uh, and you can see some increase in the contact force. And what does that do to the bone strain? If you apply that to a finite element model, which he did, you can estimate the peak strains that you can see both in compression and tension. Uh, and those strains increase as you go from two and a half to three and a half to four and a half meters per second. And that's kind of expected. And the other thing you could do is calculate the loading exposure. So this is taking into account the number of cycles uh, of this event. So this is an assumption that you run the same distance. Now what's going on here, of course, if, you run, if you're not running as fast, you might take more steps. So your total cycles per day here might be greater than if you're running at three and a half or four and a half meters per second. But what's interesting is your probability of failure then, because if you just take the number of cycles per day, you might come to the wrong conclusion that this is uh, putting yourself at more risk of damage compared to this. But when you look at the probabilities of failure, those probabilities are, uh, are shown here. And this is kind of a, a period of 100 days where we had this kind of model. What happens if you apply loads to, to the structure, to the bone in this case? And what is the probability of failure of that structure? And after a period of time, you see this plateau. And for people who are used to seeing iron new step, you, you're used to seeing this plateau. This effect, and, and there's no surprise here because what we're modeling is, is fatigue and, and the potential for fatigue damage. And it's, a, it's good that it plateaus because if it didn't plateau and just was linear, it just meant no matter um, what you did, you would get fatigue damage and you would get ultimate failure of that bone if you just kept running. But we know that bone is a material that if you stay within this, uh, this fairly broad band of this lazy bone uh, or lazy uh, band, you can withstand this repetitive cyclic loading for a long period of time. But what's important to note here is if you run faster, 
you get greater strains and the strains are the dominant thing here that lead to the probability of failure. And so that's why you see up here a greater percentage. So if you think of this as a percentage, this might be a 25% uh, probability of failure as opposed down here to say a 9% probability of failure. And you can see those here as well. Okay, so interesting take home message from this one, if you're dealing with athletes, is that the speeds and the mileage um, relative here, um, it turns out that the speeds are more important because the speeds are changing the loading magnitude uh, rather than the total load exposure or the total number of cycles. And so you should be running at lower speeds to reduce that magnitude if you want to reduce the probability of failure. And that's, of course, what clinicians invariably do with someone who has a fatigue fracture. They reduce the, the, the loading. And that's uh, obviously an effective strategy um, to begin with. So we're doing some work as well, also with Irene Davis and Mary Buchstein, who's a bone biologist at Harvard, where we're following a cohort of basketballers to try and validate some of these approaches. We're using some fancy imaging methods. This is high-res PQCT, where we can look at the trabecular architecture and the bone density in high detail. And we're looking at metatarsal as well as the, the tibia and trying to see how do our models then uh, predict the, the, the bone health in these athletes? So stay tuned, we've got some more work coming out on, on that as well.